Well, good morning. Good morning. So we do not design buildings that never fail. Not much is pretty obvious, right? We don't design buildings that never fail. But here's something a little bit more provocative for you. We shouldn't be designing buildings that never fail. We shouldn't be designing buildings that never fail. So let's talk a little bit about failure. Um, there are three things that we worry most about with respect to, to failure, right? We worry about structural failure. We worry about fire. And we worry about water, which is to say that we worry about the things that will kill us quickly before the things that will kill us slowly, or the things that will just annoy us or, or cost us money. And uh, we tend to think of structural resistance and fire resistance as absolutes. Either the building is structurally sound or it's not. Either our building is resistant to fire or it isn't. But that is patently false and entirely unhelpful. Uh, our buildings are not designed to never fall down, and they're not designed to never burn. What we really do is we design our buildings to resist the most common stresses in the environment that we build them in, and we design them to fail if they fail in a way that's intended to minimize loss of life, right? I'm here at this conference to talk mostly about stucco failures. And honestly, I think a lot of the confusion surrounding uh, stucco and adhered stone assemblies is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how buildings work, how walls, how walls work. We place too much emphasis on the integrity of our, our barriers, whatever that is, our barrier and not enough emphasis on the performance of the wall system as a whole, or our building system as a whole. Just like structure, just like fire, we want to be designing buildings that respond to the most common stresses in the environment that we build them in, and we want to design them to fail if they fail in a way that's intended to minimize damage. The, the barrier line of thinking, the sort of pass-fail approach to this stuff, uh, right, wrong, good product, bad product, is, is antithetical to this, to this. Now, that's not to say that whatever we select as our, as our particular control layer at, at issue uh, doesn't matter. Obviously, it matters. It matters what we pick. It matters how we install it. We, we know that that stuff matters. What I am saying here is that water control in a building is not something that you can just buy. It's not a spec section. It is a whole series of design decisions and construction decisions. And those decisions, those choices, aren't easy a lot of the time. Designers and builders and owners need to decide what their tolerance for risk is and how much effort and expense they're willing to go to to reduce that risk. The context really, really matters here. What is the climate that we're building in, right? What is our exposure within that climate? The, what's the number of stories we're, we're intending here? What's the architectural complexity of the facade? What, um, what's the building's purpose? What do we want to do in the building? 
what are the owner and the occupant's expectations regarding maintenance? What's their competence level regarding maintenance? What are their expectations regarding performance and, and comfort? And what resources are they are available to us to, to that end? What resources are available to us during design and construction? And not just money, right? But uh, intellectual capital, experience and education are resources too. What do we have available to us? Now what you're really doing when you're considering these factors and when you're, when you're weighing risk like this is you're deciding how to prioritize among different values. And building science has nothing to say about that. Physics can't tell you how to build your building because physics don't care. Now it's, of course, if you know the physics, right, you're in a much better position to, to weigh, weigh all those values a little differently and make hopefully better decisions and, and that's really why, why we're here learning. But that concept is, is really difficult for a lot of people to understand particularly for owners, for our clients. That is really, really hard. Having to make real decisions with real consequences is hard. I want this and not that. When there's, when there's a consequence attached to each of those, that makes people very uncomfortable. And here, not surprisingly, is where people's stated preferences often diverge a great deal from their revealed preferences. A lot of people will tell you that indoor air quality and energy efficiency is, is important to them. But when they're offered the opportunity to, say, bring their attic into their conditioned space and insulate on the, on the pitch instead of on the flat and pay attention to that wall to roof connection, and the cost of doing so is roughly the same as a, as a kitchen upgrade. We, we all know how a lot, of those, a lot of those decisions go. And how many other design decisions are some version of, of exactly that, right? We pick uh, aesthetics over durability. <laughs> we'll pick uh, loyalty sometimes over competence, you know, working with someone that we want to work with over the most competent person. Um, cost over performance is the classic one, right? Properly understood, a great many of our building failures aren't failures at all. What they really are is nothing more than the unhappy consequences of foolish decisions voluntarily made. And that brings me to what all of us in the building industry really do in, in one form or another, what our job really actually is, whether we, whether we acknowledge it or think of it in this way or not. Our job is to exercise professional judgment. And uh, to do that, we, we take everything we know about, about design, about spatial relationships, about construction, about materials, about people, uh, about, about building science, and we use that to help owners make the best decisions for their buildings that reflect what they value, not what we value, not what we wish they valued, but what they value. And more importantly than that, we need to use that professional, that same professional judgment to determine when it's appropriate to override their preferences. And that is hard. 
that is really, really hard. We have, we've got codes and, and we've got standards, right? And, and those keep us out of the most egregious types of, of failures some of the time, not all of the time. But if you spend any amount of time in this industry, you come up against the practical limitations of, of our codes and of our standards. Uh, in our daily practice, professionals are almost never called upon to make some sort of binary decision between a good building and a bad building, a good, a good product and a bad product, a good installation and a bad installation. What we're really doing is making thousands of decisions, each one of them a compromise, and each one of them aimed at aligning the design as best we can with what it is that we value the most. And um, that's hard. There, there can be no codified platonic ideal of a building because to design is to make decisions like that. And it's precisely those difficult decisions and those trade-offs that give us the flexibility to accommodate a great diversity of, of preferences and values and, and choices and situations, circumstances. It's what allows us to design warehouses differently than museums. They both store things, right? They're different. It, it's what lets us design dormitories differently than motels. The, the home that you intend to raise your children in differently than the, the investment property that you intend to rent out. And, and there's nothing easy about that. Those are, those are tough decisions. What's interesting, I think, is that building homes in factories won't change that. 3D printing homes or parts of homes won't change that either. Modularization won't change that. People are unique and places are unique. Different climates, they, not only do they bring different loads, but they also bring different, different resources. And people don't all want the same things. They, they value different things. And what's actually kind of cool is the like, absolute genius of our industry right now is in fact how extraordinarily well we, we already respond to these things. We, we accommodate a lot of different people, a lot of different tools in a lot of different circumstances already. The thing is, failure is part of that. But so is professional judgment. And how do we develop good professional judgment? We know this, right? Education and experience. Now, not just your own education and experience, but the education and the experience of, of your colleagues, too. And that is one of the things, maybe the thing, that makes conferences like this so valuable. For every presentation, you know, formal presentation you hear, you will meet 10 people with dozens of stories. Stuff that worked, stuff that didn't work, stuff they're not sure about, stuff in between. And, and each of those becomes a data point for you to hone your own professional judgment, which lets us help people to to not make foolish decisions. You get to help people make decisions that they're going to be happy about. Decisions that are going to make us proud as, as professionals. So here's to another day of doing exactly that with some of the finest people in the industry. That's you guys. Thank <laughs> you.